recording. Oh, Roger, here's a few news stories. Um, Microsoft is trying to secure their online exchange servers, which is a good thing, although I think an awful lot of people are now using Office 365 for this. But anyway, they're adding Dane and DNSSEC. Uh, one of the huge problems with email is it's typically not encrypted, and even when it is encrypted, it's not encrypted very well. Uh, it's encrypted only point to point, and you usually don't have any way to know that's happened. So these protocols here will hopefully improve that. I see K10 asking uh, something about meet.jit.c. No, I heard of something called JITC, and some people say they're going to try switching to it. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not motivated to do anything other than Zoom because my primary concern is that students should find it easy to use, which is what most people find. I've used other things like Cisco WebEx and it's horrible. Like 20% of the students cannot connect. It requires goofy ports and a firewall and stuff. Um, and somebody is asking me how many points the final is. It's about 80. Uh, it should say uh, somewhere. Let's see. I should be able to find it here on the schedule. Well, maybe not. I guess it would be inside the, um, well, it might be in the grading sheet. Let's see. Uh, now that you ask, I don't know where the grading sheet is anymore. All oh, right here, grading, good. Hopefully it's in here. And then again, maybe not. Well, it's about 80 points. And I, yeah, I think it'll, it shows inside the uh, canvas, um, but I'm not sure it's up there yet. Good question. There's a lot of extra credit though, so you should be able to uh, get enough points pretty much regardless of the final if you do the extra credit projects. Anyway, um, this I find very interesting. Now, of course, I did my thesis on quantum mechanics and studied physics and, you know, people worried about these things and time is very strange stuff. And um, this new technique to try to deal with time is really very interesting. There's a fundamental problem in physics that if you knew the location and momentum of every particle, you could predict the future forever. So apparently the world is just predetermined totally and it's just a movie playing. And that seems ridiculous. It seems like we have choices and such. And this guy's now applying some modern theories to it. Um, since Turing, who studied computers, we've known that information is real and there's an information content in things. And so what this guy pointed out is that um, if you actually had knowledge, if, if the world had determined the exact location and momentum of particles to an infinite number of decimal places, that would mean it has an infinite amount of information content. And that doesn't make any sense. So he said the world is probably intrinsically uncertain and only determined to a certain number of places. And this is a, there's a whole bunch of physics that rely on this. Uh, the, think it's related to the Russian inflationary universe cosmology. Um, the mathematics that Americans use for physics involves these infinitely small quantities and it leads to a lot of weird problems and there's probably no reason to think that way. There's no reason to think that things are infinitely precise or infinitely small. There's probably some granularity to it. Anyway, he's beginning to get some, a new understanding of what time is, which is a really big issue. Anyway, um, so these guys find that uh, the same thing that are usually wrong in penetration. Oh, that could be. I didn't see the name of the article, uh, the person who wrote the article. Anyway, um, the, the, um, anyway, these guys find that the same old problems every year after year are what people have. The most obvious things like brute forcing weak passwords, something to do with Kerberos. I don't really know what this is, and the usual nonsense. Um, so this is something that's been known for quite a while. The... Um, the things that get the most attention if you go to a conference is the latest exciting vulnerability, but the things that actually matter much are just boring routine uh, house cleaning issues, like making sure that people actually have chosen better passwords and not chosen to reuse a password that's already leaked, stuff like that. Anyway, um, there's a Trojan that supposedly attacks one in 10 Mac OS users. Um, and it sounds like good, clean fun. I wonder if I've had it. I don't think I've got it, but anyway, it's, um, it's nice to see, and uh, the Slayer is this thing. And uh, so here's the details. It installs this thing, and it tricks you into installing it. And um, then you have an application, and it looks like it pretends to be the BlueStack player, which is something we've seen here before. And one thing that's fun here is it presents you with some page to click on, 
which is transparent. And what's really happening behind is a system dialogue asking if you want to install this extension. So this is something I thought had been patched a long time ago. This is clickjacking, which will tap patch. We'll talk a little more about it later on Android. You're not supposed to be able to do this, to put some kind of visible component on top of a system dialogue. This is why in Windows 10, when you hit critical system dialogues, the screen turns dark. You go to a secure desktop just to prevent you from doing this. But apparently Macs are still vulnerable to that. Anyway, uh, let's see if anything else here. So Microsoft has some very strange DNS problems, and they always had. And um, way back in early versions of Windows, the default for the domain is corp. And if you just install something and don't change the default, then your machine will try to connect to corp.com on the internet. So if you buy corp.com on the real internet, a large number of Windows machines will automatically start sending sensitive data up to them. So to prevent this, Microsoft finally bought corp.com. So they will own it. Uh, there's a similar problem that you get if you take the DNS security class. Microsoft um, misconfigured their DNS so that it constantly looks for records from private addresses on the internet, which creates a huge flood of useless traffic and a big problem on the internet. And there are special black hole servers just to deal with that. Anyway, so let's uh, get back to CNET 128. So here we are. I just put out the midterm grades. And um, so you'll see them in the canvas. And we're down here to 4.8. So the, I'm up to the 700 projects. And so if you find that you cannot jailbreak your iPhone and do the 700 projects, just do other projects for extra credit. Although a lot of people now do have iPhones. Some people have trouble with it. It's a fairly new thing. And by the way, project 502 is giving students trouble. And I just set it up here and I have seen the problem. The newest version 502 I've got set up here. You have a, um, Jenny, you have a phone running, the Drozer agent, and you've got a Kali machine behind it, and you connect with Drozer agent, then you install Twitter, and when you run it, there's only two permissions here where the project says you should have three. There should be one here with auth in it, which is no longer there. So I'm gonna modify that project 502 to deal with that. I'm either gonna have to change the project so you don't need to inspect that permission or put up an old version of the Twitter app. I'll, um, I'll let you know next week what I did there. Anyway, let me uh, just get out of this for now. Does exit get out? It does. All right. All right. So today I just want to talk about the um, how to write a secure app instructions, which is nothing more really than a summary of all the things we've done on the offensive side before. So let me make this bigger. I don't like having it full screen because then I can't point at things. All right. So. Uh, here's the common vulnerabilities we've seen, code injection, logic flaws, and so on. So the main principles you have here, you're going to uh, the least, try to get the least exposure. This, I'll talk about the security mechanisms and some mechanisms to slow down a reverse engineer, which you can probably appreciate more now that we've done some reverse engineering and modifying Smalley code. So the fundamental point here is to find all the exposed, the attack surface, they call it. So you find all the ways that you can inject data into the app and see which ones of those are dangerous and try to remove the unnecessary one. So remember you got the four kinds of components. You had activities, which are pages you can see, broadcast receivers, content providers, which are databases, and services. And if these things are not exported, then they're only accessible from inside the app. But if they're exported, they can be reached from other apps. So from Drozer's point of view, that's what you call the attack surface because those are things that could be attacked by a malicious app on the phone, which is certainly a very realistic thing to do in the world of Android. So you shouldn't be storing data that you don't need to store. Um, as I've mentioned many times, it is amazing how many Android apps store passwords foolishly when there's no need to do it, and that's the first mistake. Um, if you are gonna store something, your private directory is a little better then the SD card, then it's protected by the Android sandbox, which is not all that strong, but it does mean that you need to find a root exploit to get into uh, another app's permission of uh, their home folder. So if you have inputs coming in from the SD card or the various radio signals, if you're going to accept input from these things into your app, then you should really verify that it is um, 
from a trusted source or who passes some sanity rules, um, this would be best. You should not give your app a bunch of permissions that it doesn't need. Uh, so it's better to avoid giving them risky permissions like install packages um, or using the system uh, identity. That's like running your browser in administrative mode while you're browsing the web is just an unnecessary risk. And you can put extra files in the APK. Remember your APK comes from sort of compressing a whole directory into a zip file and some developers accidentally leave extra files there with sensitive things in them. All right. So here's the security mechanism. You trace these functions, your activities, broadcast receivers, content providers, and services. Um, these are the functions that receive data from other applications. And so those are logical places to check for security flaws. All right, uh, we mentioned before, the if you declare a new um, scheme, you should only make it available. An exported component should only be available to apps with the same signature as much as possible. Then you don't have anybody else's app feeding data in. If you really want to publish something to the whole world, like Skype did, then you have to be very careful because you're more likely to have malicious input coming in. All right, uh, if you don't want people going into your activities in unexpected ways, you can remove your app from the recent app list if you like, so it's not just there in the pages you can flip through. Um, and you can prevent tap jacking, which is what I was just talking about in that Mac malware. Um, this will prevent touches from being sent through elements. So when you touch the screen, you must be affecting the thing you can see and not something behind it. That would certainly seem like a really good thing to do. Another thing people have talked about is your, if the dictionary is enabled in your app, then the text you type in the app might be captured and added to the dictionary. And if you, like a password might leak in there. So you can put in um, this attribute to tell it to not take the data put in there and enter it in the dictionary. Fragments are something we talked about before a couple chapters ago. You can have little user interface elements that customize activities, but it turned out to be a, um, a risk. There was a way, in some, well, some of the versions of Android, you could inject extra data here that could lead to trouble. So it's blocked by default. And if you want to allow them, you can allow the fragments you want carefully, but not just in all the fragments. In general, you got to have trust boundaries. So we've talked about this before. There shouldn't be a way to go from an unauthenticated area to an authenticated area. It's the same with web apps. You have to have some kind of variable, which is uh, common to the whole app, which tells it whether you have already authenticated or not. You can mask password displays, so you'll just see dots and not the visible password on the screen. And we talked especially before about browsable activities. Browsable activities can open web pages and that puts them at high risk. So you usually don't want to do that unless you really want to run a browser. And as I mentioned before, quite a few apps make the mistake of including their own custom browser instead of using the default browser. And now you've inherited the security of actually securing your in-app browser. So you have to be careful about that. And your content providers contain data and the problem is in early versions of Android, they were all exported by default. So you can prevent that by explicitly uh, not having exported equal to false or by just targeting a later API, which would probably be a pretty safe move. Now, there probably aren't that many people using phones that old. SQL injection is the same problem here. Do I have any info on how to view the user dictionary? Um, I don't know how, Rich, it's a good question. Uh, it's probably, if you have root access, it's probably just a file in there somewhere. I haven't looked. It's a good question. I do not know the answer. So in SQL injection, the solution here is the same as it is in all other versions of SQL. Instead of taking data from the user like Book and Wiley and just putting it in a line of text where you parse and try to match apostrophes, you put it in here, type equals question mark and brand equals question mark, and then you feed it a user input data structure that includes the data. So the data that came from the user is inserted as a data object and cannot be misunderstood as a code object. This is uh, the same way you protect it in other versions of SQL. 
prepared statements that explicitly explain what part of it is data and do not rely on parsing and matching quotes to decide the boundary between data and commands. There's directory traversal where you use a dot dot slash dot dot slash to crawl out of where you ought to be into other folders you shouldn't be in. And so there is a get canonical path method that will remove that, that will take the relative path that the user might have typed in and turn it into an absolute path, which you can then check to see if it's the right absolute path. So here they're doing something involving using a file. So you get the canonical path to the file. And now you can make sure it always starts with your base folder. So the path, which goes right to the start, slash start of the whole system, must always go to the base folder of my app and anything else I reject. That's reasonable. That makes sure your app is only manipulating its own data and not somebody else's data. All right, uh, we talked before about pattern matching. You can set controls and you might give a path like this, but if you only refer to this, then it won't match with subdirectories and so on. So you might need to use wildcards to carefully do this. That was true of that um, storage app that we tried with Drozer. It had a pattern match to restrict permissions that was defeatable by just adding another slash at the end so it didn't match the pattern anymore. Some people have these secret codes. You type special code numbers and it does something special, but those are easily enumerated. You can even download apps on the App Store to see all the secret codes. So you should be aware that uh, anything you put in a secret codes is not really all that secret. If you're gonna store files, you can set permissions explicitly. Um, instead of just getting the default, if you don't set permissions, it will inherit permissions from the umask variable and you don't necessarily know what that is. So it would be better to specify that it's private. Make these files private only for your app's user account. You can encrypt things. Now, a lot of people make custom encryption and foolishly encrypt things. Um, AES is the best symmetric encryption method, but in general, symmetric encryption is a pretty bad idea because now you have a key you have to hide somewhere. Um, you should avoid electronic code book mode. This is one reason people were angry at Zoom. Uh, Zoom claimed to use AES-256, but what they really used was AES-128 in electronic code book mode, which has the defect of preserving some patterns in the output. There was also a disclosure that sometimes that key was sent to Chinese servers when it shouldn't be. And so this is why everyone is freaking out about Zoom. You know, if I, I was, um, another thing which I thought was really silly, a bunch of people say Zoom is not safe because you're, when you save your movie, it always has the same name. It's like zoom underscore one dot MP4 or something. So if people just drag that and put it on the web. You can just search for that file name and find all these Zoom videos people have posted. And uh, I don't really think it's fair to call it Zoom's fault that the users recorded things and put it up when they shouldn't have. But anyway, um, Zoom is trying hard to improve their security. They got a feature freeze for 90 days to try to deal with this because some school districts actually freaked out and banned Zoom and uh, people are worrying about whether it's really safe enough to use. Certainly my stuff is not private anyway. All this stuff goes right up on YouTube for the whole world afterwards. But now people are having business meetings and government meetings and stuff over Zoom. And uh, in that case, they have probably more legitimate reasons to worry about it being uh, unsafe. By the way, um, if you're gonna store a password, the book says you should hash it. You really have to use salting and stretching and it's far better not to do it yourself, but to just put it in some place like the Android keychain. If you use the random function, it's the same all the time. There's a thing called secure random that's better. So be aware of this. If you try to generate random numbers to do cryptography, you have to be careful which functions you use. It's far better to avoid doing cryptography if you can, just use some standard code. Anyway, here's an example of the random code here. Um, various ways to generate random numbers. And when I tried it here, you can see them coming out. We used an online Java, so you can try different versions of Java and different commands to see how they work if you want to. Um, if you do key generation, there's function password based key derivation function is one way to use many rounds of hashing to derive a key from a password. Um, and then you can store it in the key store. That's a common way to turn a password into a, something like a 128 bit key so you can use it for something like AES. 
So if you want to let other apps see a file, you can give them this read write permission and then they can access files as long as they're in the document folder. So this is what you do if you really want to publish something and share it with other apps. Secure communications, we've certainly gone through quite a bit. Um, there are still some apps that send unencrypted data over the internet, and that's a terrible idea even for harmless data because it can be modified. HTTPS is much better, but if you don't validate the certificate authorities, it's not very good, although it's better than HTTP. What's better is to test the certificate authorities to make sure they are real public authorities and even to use some form of certificate pinning where you notice not only that it is one of the trusted authorities, but that it is the correct trusted authority. And this will help protect you from BGP, man in the middle attacks, like what Russia did last week. They, this has happened several times. Russia and China and many other people have attacked BGP, so they reroute global traffic on the internet from certain locations to pass through their country for a while. And when they're in the middle, they can then use their trusted national certificate authorities to sign certificates, and they'll fool apps that don't have some form of certificate pinning. It's a pretty exotic attack. And again, I think this is not something that normal users have to worry about. This is probably more an issue for things like internet voting and government meetings and things like that, which are going to really be attacked by attackers with a lot of money and a lot of skill. So uh, using the API is best if you want to send data from one app to another. You can open network sockets and use them, but it, or use the clipboard, but both of those are less safe. All right, and web views, we've talked about web views, lets you put a web page in an activity, but um, frequently it's implemented incorrectly, so it's not very secure what's going on in there. Uh, all right, so you can disable JavaScript in your web view, which would make it quite a lot safer. You can remove plugins from web view, like Flash. Does anybody actually run Flash on an Android? I guess they could, but I think Flash is pretty much over. Um, you can block your web view from accessing the file system, which is certainly a good idea. And you can avoid this um, JavaScript bridge. The JavaScript bridge is quite risky. So unless you're really using it, you wouldn't want to let your web pages run native Java applications. All right, and then there's the Android manifest, the main file that determines the uh, settings controlling your apps. You can determine whether your app is allowed to back up the data and whether it's allowed to be debugged. Um, normally you do want to let it back up the data because the customer might want to move their app to a new phone and keep the old data. But normally I don't know why you would allow your app to be debugged. I, that seems like something should be turned off in production. You can set your SDK version. This is the lowest SDK version available. And if you set it at 17 or above, then you avoid this exported uh, content providers. And if so, setting it higher would be better for security, but that means customers with old phones can't use your app. So you have to make a balance call there. Android 9 had a lot of new features. It has the option for DNS over TLS so-called DOE, um, and it discourages you from sending plain text apps and has many other changes to improve it. Uh, I found this Cloudflare blog has instructions for how to take an Android 9 device and switch it to use DNS over HTTPS on their server, 1111, which Cloudflare is set up to be a particularly secure and private server. So that's something you could do to prevent people from sniffing your DNS requests. All right, and you should disable logging and release builds. We've seen plenty of apps that leak secrets into the log and there's no reason for that. Um, ProGuard can remove this code if you want it. And if you organize your code correctly, you'll have some central controlling of logging so you can just block it in the production app. If you write native code, which is not Java, to compiled like in C++ or C Sharp or whatever it's written in, then um, it's in general considered risky. Um, because you're going to have the old fashioned C problems like buffer overflows and such. So there are, you have the old uh, defenses here, like stack canaries and non executable and so on. So relocation read only prevents rewriting the global offset table like we're doing in the exploit development class to hook code execution and redirect it to code you injected. Um, our run path is a um, 
thing that would allow attackers to load modified libraries, which might not be what you want, and so on. So we talked about the protection level downgrade. In older versions of Android, you can define a permission with a malicious app, and then when a new app is installed, it will inherit the permission level of the previous app, so you can uh, arrange a phone to be less secure than it should be. So your app can check for those to make sure that the protection levels are intact. Uh, if you have non-exported components, they can still receive data from other apps if those apps have root permission. So you might want to check for that. And you can do that with as basically an anti-CSRF token is what they call it on the web. You have a token stored in memory available only to your app which must be used to identify that it really is the legitimate app coming in. This is the same way you protect web apps from a stolen cookie. The cookie, there's another token which is not sent with the cookie, so that if someone steals the cookie and tries to get in the web app, it identifies that you aren't the right person. It's a lot like two-factor authentication. And then we've talked about how you can see the code with your Android app and you can read it and modify it. So if you want to slow it down, you obfuscate the code. ProGuard is what many apps use. It's free, but very ineffective. DexGuard is the paid version, hopefully better. Dash O is, I think, what I used to produce this because they did have a 15-day free trial. And you see it takes uh, variable names that would be something like password or credit card number and turns them into these meaningless strings. So that's pretty good. ArcSan is another product. Uh, these are products which can really scramble the code. They won't make it impossible for reverse engineer, but they will slow and reverse engineer down. If you want to see if your phone is rooted, I do find perhaps 5% of the apps I test actually detect root and block it. And you're just looking for obvious clues. Look for the presence of a super user uh, executable. See if ADB runs as root. Look for things like super user. Uh, it's pretty easy to detect. You can detect if you're in an emulator. The same as malware can detect if it's running in a virtual machine. The emulators are not sneaky. They leave tags and marks around that can be looked for. And you can detect whether your app is in a debugger. Um, you can see, you can make sure your app is not debugged by just turning off debuggable in the manifest. And this is another thing you probably want to do. And you can check the signature. You can check the signature of the app to make sure it's correct. And we've seen in that MAD HAR app, it just took something like a SHA-256 and compared it to a hard-coded value. Uh, these are other ways to detect tampering. Of course, a more sophisticated reverse engineer could find your tamper detection code and remove it, but all any security measure ever does is raise the bar and make it more difficult for the attacker. Nothing's ever perfect. So that's that, which is really just a, basically a summary of everything we talked about before, only on the blue terms team side instead of the red team. So let me bring up my cahoots, which should be in Firefox here. And somehow, I don't see Firefox coming to the front. Let's see if I can get my Firefox. This is Firefox. This is also brave, apparently. All right. Where's Firefox? Maybe this is Firefox here? Nope. All right. The problem with multiple screens. Let's just hit a new one. Ah, there we are, a Firefox screen. Because you can't run this in Brave, at least I can't. There are security settings that can be adjusted in Brave, but I haven't figured out how to use them yet. All right. So this is 128, Chapter 9. And here we are. All right. And I should have a place to put my answers. And I do. All right. Good. So, see how many people there are. 
All right, could get up to 11. I'll give it a few more seconds. All right, I guess that's all we're getting. Oh, maybe not. Okay, here come a few more. Give it five more seconds. All right. So, what function do you use to create a key from a password? That's it, password-based key derivation function. All right. What makes HTTPS more secure? Okay, that's certificate pinning where you have some other information about what certificate should be used beyond it just being in the trusted store. All right, how do you stop tap jacking? Two touches when obscured, the name is nice and clear. This means a hidden component cannot be touched, which would make sense. All right. And how do you stop SQL injection? Okay, prepared statements. Right. So we've got winners. Land three. Good. And I know who K is. Good. Real names. All right. So that's all I have for that lecture. I just want to mention one more thing I was telling people about. Um, Probably because of being locked down, I appear to be going mad. And uh, so I decided to learn COBOL. There was a, the, so I made a COBOL CTF and it made me part of a conference next week. I submitted it and they didn't just tell me to get lost, which is what I expected. Grimcom, they haven't approved it yet, but they're interested. So they might approve this. So the point is, let me bring it up. Uh, people are looking for COBOL coders again. COBOL was I think the second computer language ever written. I think it was actually written by Grace Hopper. The first language was Fortran 4, which is what I learned, but COBOL came out for business applications. It was invented in 1959, so you would think nobody would possibly care about it anymore, but this keeps happening. There's a ton of established infrastructure that's still using this incredibly old language. It's as old as I am. So, they keep trying to get people to come back and fix their COBOL code, and it's getting to where the people with experience in COBOL are in their 80s. So it's awfully hard to get these people back. So anyway, there's a little bit of interest in learning it. So I made a CTF to learn COBOL, and it's actually been kind of fun. So if you want, this is worth extra credit in my classes and maybe part of a con. If you want to do it, it's uh, you go to my homepage and scroll down a bit, look for GrimCon. There's the COBOL CTF, which I'm adding more to right now. Um, anyway, so if you wanna, maybe I'll demonstrate it. Since we've got a little time here, let me bring up, all I did was set up a Debian cloud machine. You could install it on anything, I suppose, but I wrote it using a standard uh, Debian cloud machine. 
which is what I usually use for pretty much everything these days, because you can get them free from Google. And so, uh, to take a look at the first one, once you have a server, this is Hello World. I think I've already got it set up here, COBOL. And yeah, so when you write code, this, by the way, is the modern version of COBOL to be less irritating than the original version. The original version was intended to be put on Hollerith cards, these punch cards, and therefore had a strange uh, layout. But anyway, this is a COBOL program. Yeah, this one I wrote in the old-fashioned mode, where you'd have to put a six-digit number. The star here determines a comment. That's the column seven, and the rest has to be over here. This is the old-fashioned form of COBOL that does it this way. Um, now, I didn't decide to make everybody do it that way in the CTF. So let me make a directory, go to CBL1 and go into there, just so I can demonstrate this one. All right, and so now if I make hello.cbl, I can put in this code. There are code divisions. There are four different kinds of division in COBOL code. And the identification division determines the name of your program is just a label and procedures are where the commands are and display is the print statement. So that is about the minimal possible program. And to compile it, you use this free version of the COBOL compiler, uh, which enables you to break the original rules and do things like not have a line number on every statement. So now you can have hello. And it prints hello world. So you a flag there. Now the variables are kind of screwy. You have string variables. You have a uh, a 20 means up to 20 characters and you have numbers which are a certain number of digits. And this by the way is what caused the Y2K problem. They actually made two digit numbers to store the years and they were writing COBOL. So that's how it was actually handled. It was not like a modern date format you'd see in say Linux where it counts the number of seconds since 1970 or something, because remember, this was coming from 1959. Before anybody thought that way, they just stored the date as two digits. Anyway, now you can define strings and print them out, and you can move things into the strings, so this will alter the content of a string variable with the move command and change a number. And now you can build an HTTP get in COBOL, and you can use it to fetch flags off my server and such. So there's just a series of challenges here. And a couple of people started doing this. I think there were only two people last I checked. Yeah, still just two people have been doing it, but I'm writing more. I've just been writing cryptography, and now I'm up to arrays in COBOL, and we did file I.O., so there'll be a series of challenges here if anybody is crazy enough to want to learn this. It is certainly not one of the top 10 or 20 languages that's of commercial interest, though. You should only do this if you're sort of looking at it as a hobby. Anyway, um, somebody's asking me, how does email know when to put messages in the spam folder? Um, Google uses something they purchased called Postini, which is almost like AI. It uses crowdsourcing, I know. If other people throw it in spam, it decides to call it spam. I've noticed in the last couple of years that the Google spam folder is spectacularly bad. It doesn't stop much of the spam and it throws away a lot of good stuff in the spam. It keeps on throwing away student homework in the spam. So um, I know they use all sorts of advanced techniques, but as far as I can tell, they don't work very well. Anyway, any other questions about anything? I guess I'm going to stop the recording. I'll leave the share going for a little while. To